So I want to first spend this segment on that subject and then get into an outrageous challenge by a professor claiming that, uh, you know, prove climate change isn't real, I'll give you $30,000, but then admitting it's not really a real challenge. Like the professor here in Austin that said he'd live in a, you know, in a trash bin for a year to prove we can all live with less, and then it turned out he didn't really stay there. I mean, this is outrageous. We're going to talk to him about that and so much more about the stunts they pull and the latest. But Lord Christopher Moncton, a top journalist, former top advisor to Margaret Thatcher, uh, and so much more, and, and the leading scientist exposing the fraud. Everything he's written about on his site in the last decade has all been proven absolutely accurate. And so now they're calling for his arrest and, and execution uh, in major publications because they're such uh, liberals, uh, is Lord Christopher Moncton. But, but what about the fact that our border is wide open? I mean, this is epic. This is totally epic. And the same thing's been done to the UK. What are we facing? How do we stop it? Well, it's very difficult to stop it when you elect a left-wing government. Because once they take office, Alex, they then want to hold on to office. And eventually they become unpopular because high taxes and low government performance, eventually people get bored of that. But the way they can turn the terms of political trade in their favor is to say, right, we'll let in left-wing immigrants, poor immigrants from wherever we can get them, because the first generation of those immigrants will always vote left. And this has been increasingly the pattern now. You see it with Tony Blair, you see it certainly with Obama. In order to get Obama elected, he was elected by people who largely didn't originally come from the United States. They came from somewhere else. And those are the ones that will vote left because the left will promise them handouts, which they say they will take from the rich to give to the poor. And so the left can, can live off this and gain themselves office for longer and longer periods as a result of it. And of course, in the end, what will defeat them is that however hard they try to trash the economy with climate change measures, around the world, everybody is paying no attention. And most countries are getting rapidly a great deal richer. As prosperity increases, so that it eventually will even reach places like Mexico, which are largely very poor at the moment, but they will become more wealthy, the pressure for immigration to still wealthier countries will diminish. And when that happens, the left will be extinguished. So I think we're going through a temporary difficulty where the left will bend the electoral rules to, by letting people in and then giving them the vote, as Tony Blair did in Britain and as Obama is doing on a very large scale in the United States. Obama is the most nakedly partisan political president you've ever had. He doesn't see himself as president of the United States. He sees himself as the chief Reich's commissar. He sees himself as the, uh, effectively, the king. And he does undoubtedly have a deep, I mean, I didn't believe D'Souza two years ago when he put out America 2016 that it really was the fact that Obama truly hated free market and wealth and success because you tend to think once you're the president and once people are in power, they understand that wealth and prosperity is a good thing. I mean, that's an instinct for normal, well-adjusted people. But then you realize, no, they really want to shut off our power plants, open our borders, wreck the whole culture, attack the family. I mean, these people are mentally ill degenerates. Never underestimate the extent to which the left hate the West. They hate the countries that bring them up. They hate the prosperity. They hate the success. They hate the democracy. They hate the liberty. They hate the freedom. They do not want it. They want absolute control. That's why the word totalitarian is so important. It means somebody who wants to control every little aspect of your life down to the last flickering, poisonous, mercury-filled light bulb. And of course, just That's the word for them. They are totalitarians. That's the thing. And this is a very ancient divide in politics, which you and I have talked of before, Alex. It goes right back to early imperial China, where the totalitarians were known as legalists, and the more enlightened libertarians, the likes of you and me, Alex, we, we were called the Confucians. And this divide between legalism and Confucianism, between totalitarianism and libertarianism, between those who would control us and we who would be free, and we who would allow others to be free, that divide is the fundamental divide in politics and always has been and probably always will be. Because it's the control freaks that like to go into government. And a control freak, of course, is a totalitarian. He wants to control everything, the totality. 
of what is within his reach. And this is what Obama is all about. And what is interesting about it is a growing sense that of quasi-moral superiority that they have. They like to say, we have to save the planet from itself because only we understand the need to save the planet from global warming, for instance. Now, this is basically a device to try to cover up that what they're really doing is nakedly partisan. Obama doesn't like the coal industry because the coal industry are and have long been the biggest donors to the Republican Party who are his opponents. It is as simple as that. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the climate. That's why he makes such idiotic statements about it every time he speaks about it. For instance, it was a wonderful moment, I think about 10 days ago, in the Senate, well, I think it was Senator Graham, was cross-examining five former heads of the Environmental Destruction Agency. And there they all were, sitting... Hold on, I want to hear that story straight ahead with Lord Christopher Monckton. We'll give you his website on the other side. I'm Alex Jones, Infowars.com. Scienceandpublicpolicy.org is his website. We'll put that up on screen for TV viewers. Lord Christopher Monckton is our guest. This is a short segment, long segment coming up. Then we're going to your phone calls. And then on to a professor uh, out in California uh, who is working in the globalist-controlled UC Davis. We're going to have Professor Hamamoto on who's saying this border being open is exactly what Lord Moncton just said, total social engineering with a permanent political underclass of the system. And we need gridlock in government. It's designed to have separation of powers. If the Republican Party was trying to extinct the Democratic Party, I want a third, a fourth, a fifth party. I would be defending the Democratic Party. I've never thrown my weight behind the Republicans until now. That is the Republican Tea Party movement. Because the Republican leadership along with the Democrats is trying to extinct it right now. This is a big deal. The Democrats, is what Lord Moxley just started getting at, are in a political takeover mode for a political oligarchy to carry out a totalitarian system. And, and they're not making any bones about it. They say, we have the moral authority, we are going to arrest people that disagree with climate change. You don't have a right to promote pro-gun stuff and terrorize people, Hillary said. We want to arrest you. The, the enemy is an Al-Qaeda, it's the Tea Party. I mean, this is outrageous stuff going on. It's for real. And Lord Moncton was speaking to that, and then he also started getting into uh, the climate fraudsters being questioned in Congress. Go ahead, Lord Moncton. Yeah, just to tell you the story about uh, these uh, four or five uh, ex-administrators of the Environmental Destruction Agency, and Senator Graham was questioning them, and he said, hands up, any of you who think that Mr. Obama was right when he said that temperatures are rising faster than ever before. He said it twice recently, and not a single hand went up. You see this row of dummies sitting there looking uncomfortable as they had to admit by their not raising their hands that Obama had got it wrong. And in fact, just in, I've just picked it up off the satellite during the break, breaking news. We now have had no global warming. According to the remote sensing systems satellites, which monitor global warming around the world, we haven't had any global warming at all for 17 years and 10 months. And the significance of that figure is that it's over half the entire satellite measurement of global temperatures. That started in 1979. For over half of that period, the last half, there has been no global warming at all. So if anybody ever tells you, oh, but look at all these extreme weather events, we've got a hurricane on the 4th of July, we've got all these things that have never happened before, of course they have all happened before, the one thing we know didn't cause them is global warming because there hasn't been any. And it's really as simple as that, Alex. Wow. And we've got a long segment coming up. You're going to get into this ridiculous challenge, another hoax, where they say everyone agrees that climate change is real. Well, of course, climate change is always going on. Doesn't mean you pay the UN a tax to, to stop it. Well, Alex, you're too young to remember, but um, climate change has been going on for 4.5 thousand million years ever since the world began. And the fact that they're now saying, oh, we've discovered it's real and everybody's got to agree with us. Everybody has always agreed that climate change is real. And I wrote to this professor, this fellow called Keating, uh, and I said to him, look, we all accept uh, climate change is real. We all accept also that humans can have some effect on the climate. The question is, did they have 
a lot of effect or a dangerous effect. That's what the debate's about. But he, he won't frame the question in a way that is fair or sensible. And also, he, he in, insisted on not allowing an independent third party to judge the competition. Because he's God. He said, because he wants to judge it himself. He's not going to give the money to anyone. It doesn't matter what evidence you produce. He's just going to say, you're a skeptic. I don't believe in your evidence. Therefore, I'm not giving you the prize. He's done it to several people already. So, of course, it's not a real challenge. It's a bogus challenge. It's one that the left can then report on all their websites, the Daily Cross and the Huffington Puffington. All these places are... <laughs> talking about it, but the fact is that it's just another stunt. You mentioned that word in an earlier segment, uh, and Alex, and you're quite right. What goes on is that the left increasingly governed by stunts because they can't govern on the basis of the facts. And the facts are, certainly on the global warming thing now, that it hasn't been warming for something like nearly 18 years, according to the, the satellites, probably more like 14 years, according to the terrestrial measurements, which, of course, are badly influenced by uh, urban heat island effects with people turning on their electricity. That heats up the area around cities um, and give, gives you an artificial... And by the kleptocrats putting the measurements out on black tarmacs to manipulate data... Oh, we'll, by all this sort of dodges... Stay there. We'll be right back, Lord Moncton. Uh, Scienceandpublicpolicy.org. Our sites are infowars.com, prisonplanet.com. We're going to get to the big breaking news coming up. There's some big news. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be here with a special 4th of July global transmission tomorrow. And then back this Sunday live, 4 to 6 p.m. Central Standard Time with the Sunday worldwide broadcast as well. Lord Moncton is our guest and I wanted him to continue getting into the specifics uh, of uh, this professor. Think climate change isn't man-made? Then prove it. Professor offers $30,000 reward for anyone who can disprove his theory. Texas-based professor has issued a challenge. I want to send my reporters down there to climate change deniers. See, Holocaust deniers. Uh, Dr. Keating is offering 17,500 pounds or roughly 30,000 dollars to anyone that can disprove the theory that human activity is warming the planet. He is so sure of his claim that he is not expected to pay out anytime soon. Anyone can enter the competition and the work doesn't need to be original. But Dr. Keating says he will be the final judge on winning or losing the entries. That's the Daily Mail. You know, what a sick joke uh, for this, uh, quote, Texas, Texas professor. That'd be like if I said, yeah, you can enter a contest to prove that this guy, uh, you know, isn't a knuckle-dragging uh, fraud. But there isn't an impartial group of judges here. No, I will judge. Because I know you're full of baloney. I, I, I mean, no one would buy tickets to that. No one would say that wasn't rigged. It's like Al Gore famously, I have this in the film Endgame, going, no one doubts, not one scientist on Earth, that man-made global warming is real and is going to flood everybody by 2013 and that the Arctic will be completely melted. Of course, it didn't happen. It got bigger than ever. And then one congressman goes, excuse me, um, i got to play that clip again. I forget which congressman goes, excuse me, it isn't all the scientists. There's thousands uh, and a bunch of the people in the UPC report, that they say they never were actually in that report. Well, Congressman, there are people that believe we didn't go to the moon, too. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about credible scientists. And the Congressman's like, listen, there are a bunch of people who weren't in that report who say their names were put on it. Uh-huh, aliens are going to get me. It's like when Jesse Ventura, the former governor, goes and talks to the Congressman, he goes, I have your bill here for civil unrest and FEMA camps for Americans. He goes, no, there's no bill. I don't believe space aliens are going to come out of machines and eat me. That's their response. And, and again, the, the Republicans have been horrible. But now the Democrats are going for broke for a total takeover. So Lord Moncton, I want to get into this professor. People should go visit him uh, at, at, where he's a professor. I'll tell folks where he's a professor uh, in a moment. But, I mean, these stunts have got to be called. I mean, the media is reporting on him like, well, see, he just proved it. You know, he's the judge and he's the winner. Don't people see through this as a joke?
Because nearly all the media are on the far left nowadays, you know, you're an honourable ex exception. You're so far on the far right, you've almost fallen off the edge. But, I mean, um, you know, all the far left media, they are doing their best to um, give the, 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 the new world order every favour they can. And when I say new world order, I'm not just using a vague right-wing reds under the beds phrase. At Paris next year, next December, they're going to make the next really big attempt to introduce a world government treaty. Now in Copenhagen a few years ago, 2009, they made the mistake of publishing it first on the web, where a colleague of mine found it, Dr. Willis Soon at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. He sent it to me. I publicized it first all over Canada, then all over the United States. The video in which I mentioned it went viral. Two million people had seen it in a week. I mean, it was huge. Still the fastest uh, YouTube platinum for any political speech. And then what happened was they paid for a dozen bogus pages on the web, which contained somewhere within them the words Moncton Video. They paid each of the search engines to put these bogus pages of complete gibberish that nobody would have wanted to read. It was just strings of letters and numbers uh, over and above the video that had had two million hits. That cost them, according to an expert who got in touch with me about it, not less than a quarter of a million dollars just to silence one person making one speech about their planned proposal to take over the world using the climate treaty as an excuse. What then happened, Alex, is really fascinating. In Melbourne, Australia, a left-wing radio station decided that I was just a right-wing kook. They sent a copy of the draft treaty of Copenhagen to a Queen's Council, a senior attorney. And they said to him, please, will you read this for us? And will you tell us whether or not Lord Monckton is right to say that they're trying to uh, set up a world government that isn't elected? And it's going to be a real world government. And do they use the word government in the treaty? And so, you know, they were sneering. They thought it wouldn't turn out to be real. The Queen's Counsel, the senior attorney, came back to them and he said, look, he said, Moncton has got it wrong. It is ten times worse than anything he said. This is a bid to take over the world and to stamp out democracy everywhere and to have a single, central, global government using the environment and the climate simply as a fig leaf behind which this new tyranny by Clark will be extended worldwide. The EU has already done it in Europe. Now they're going to make it go worldwide. There are EU advisers telling the UN how to grab power by making sure that each new treaty by which power is handed over by usually left-wing governments to international bodies that nobody elects is kept secret from the people until after it has been signed. And that's the technique that the, the European Union has used. I once spent years trying to get hold of a copy of what eventually became the Treaty of Maastricht. I eventually got the first copy in the country and began writing about it. And the Foreign Office denied that any such document existed. And so I produced photocopies of it, I put it up on the newspaper I was writing for, the Evening Standard. They still went on pretending it existed, and two years later, they signed it. Incredible. Lord Moncton, let, let's go to the model of Australia and talk about UKIP some, because you know, taking, yeah. uh, taking not just the United States, but the world back, Australia back, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, they then demonized you uh, in an attack piece, backfiring in, in, in TV and print articles all over Australia. That then caused you to be a cause celeb. You traveled to Australia repeatedly, toured the country, speaking to packed halls of tens of thousands, debated people on television, and now they're set and say they have the votes. We'll put it on screen next week to repeal the carbon tax that's been devastating Australian farmers, factories, you name it, uh, National Affairs, the Australian newspaper, carbon tax set for repeal next week. Uh, you helped get the secret Copenhagen Treaty that got the third world to pull out and not vote for passage in the UN, all because you took action. They blocked you from the UN meeting in Durban, South Africa. You literally parachuted into the meeting, uh, which was a stunt, fighting stunts with stunts. And, and, and again, it's just an example of taking action, perseverance, what it can do, we're gaining ground against them. Do you disagree with that statement and elaborate on what happened in Australia? Because if they repeal it, this is a stunning victory.
interesting because I briefed Tony Abbott, who's now the Prime Minister, oh, three or four years ago. At his request, I was in Canberra. I got a message from his office saying, please call in whenever you can. And so I went there and had half an hour with him and we talked through this climate thing. And he said, look, I've got to be very careful, he said, because there are those in my party who think this is a problem. He said, I don't really think it is, but I have to be very careful how I play it. But he said it's quite clear that even if it were a problem, having carbon taxes is not the solution to the problem. And that's the rather crafty way in which he's managed to persuade his own party that they should stand with him and oppose the carbon tax, because it, even if there were a problem, the carbon tax is not a good solution to it. And so he's a very, very good man. He's, he does a lot of, uh, privately, a lot of good works quietly, which he doesn't publicise. A very, very unusual politician. And I'm hoping he'll be the Prime Minister there for a very long time. The left, of course, absolutely loathe him. And because he has said that the, the climate thing is all nonsense, that he and Stephen Harper in Canada are the two who have stood out against this nonsense. And as it happens, I've briefed both of them on this. All it needs is for the, these leaders to meet Moncton, and they change their view on the climate, Alex. It's simply amazing. I want to shift gears back to this professor because... The media is besmirching my great state by saying he's a Texas professor. He's actually from the Naval War College sneaking around here. And that's another issue that they've had the Navy, the Marines, the Army putting out climate uh, hysteria. They've had NASA scientists putting out stuff, uh, you know, to fear monger and then using the name. Uh, I mean, this is outrageous. It is. I think that this, this professor with his silly scare, I wrote to him on his website and I said, look, are you prepared to have a, an independent third party judge, preferably a real judge, who's used to assessing evidence fairly on both sides of a case? And oh, no, he was not. He ran a mile from that. This man is frightened. He knows perfectly well that if there were any independent trial of this matter, he knows perfectly well who would win. In fact, I'm now working with TV producers in Canada, and we are going to put global warming on trial. And we're going to have a real judge, probably a retired one, but a real one, in a real courtroom. We're going to have, I'm going to be the prosecutor of global warming, and they've said their difficulties in finding anybody who will now defend it. <laughs> so I've given them a few names that I think might be prepared to defend it. We're each going to be allowed to choose our own witnesses. There will be a fairly chosen jury... And what we're going to do is we're going to put this in a theatre. And the idea is that then in this theatre, every night, there will be a two-hour uh, courtroom drama, effectively. Great idea. And the, case, and the case will be argued before a jury chosen from that night's audience. They get their money back if they agree to come on to the jury. And the jury will then have, uh, hear the evidence, and they'll have to be honest and try to decide it. On Ooh, the that's basis. bold to do it in Canada, because they've really bought a lot of the brainwashing up there. But what is interesting is that the ordinary people haven't. It's as, as, as always, it's the chattering classes that have bought into this because they're making money out of it, Alex. You and I know this is what it's really all about. Obama supports this whole nonsense because it means he can shut down uh, his, biggest, his opponent's biggest funders. That's what, it, that's what he's doing it for. China is now just beginning to change its tune on this. It was previously completely against it because it wants to compete with the, the West for natural resources. It doesn't need to sell its products to us. It needs to be able to have enough natural resources to make them. That's its biggest need. We're its biggest competitors to get the supplies to keep their industries going. If they can shut the West down, that suits them fine. So now they're backing climate change. Putin is backing climate change, again, for purely financial reasons. He wants to sell lots of overpriced Siberian methane gas to heat the towns and cities of Western Europe through the pipeline that runs through the... Yeah, Ukraine. foreigners are siding with Obama to literally yeah. shut off half our energy source. Is that not treason? I mean, in World War II, our fighter bombers blew up German power plants and facilities. Yeah. Well, I mean, Obama is, and, and your government shutting down power plants is, is, is doing what, 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 what bombers couldn't do to us. Well, this is exactly what's happening, but of course he did say he was going to do it. He was very open about it, and the left often are. They, are, they will often say, yes, we're going to have a war on coal, this is a dirty industry, we're going to shut it down. What was interesting was that 40 years ago in Britain, when I worked for Margaret Thatcher, at that time, the coal industry was the great, great industry of the future, the miners were the heroes of labour, I mean, they still are for me. Going down a deep mine in Britain was a very dangerous and dirty job. I was a huge admirer of the miners, but the left 
put them right up on a pedestal. When the miners went on strike against the Thatcher government, there wasn't a word from the left about how coal is a dirty fuel. No, but they changed their tune when they realized that the coal industries, particularly in places like the United States, were the ones that were bankrolling their political opponents in the Republican Party. So what do we do? We find an excuse, a totalitarian excuse, to have a war on coal and shut down the coal industry. Now, modern coal-fired power plants, you, you, you burn the coal at very, very high temperatures, so you get very, very little pollution, you trap the ash on the way out, and you don't get much pollution. It's actually as clean as burning gas. The only thing it gives off is about twice as much CO2 as gas, but CO2 is a harmless trace gas, it is the stuff of life. So what this is about, and this is why Paris is such a worrying thing, is that they are planning now to have this world government treaty put in place in Paris, and this time they won't let the, the likes of me see the draft of that treaty in advance, and I can tell you how I know that. Because in 2012 I went to the Doha conference, where they finally banned me for life for telling them there'd been no global warming at that stage for 16 years. Now it's going on for 18 years. And they banned me for life. They didn't want that said. And when I was there, I was trying to get a copy of what are called the draft conclusions from the chair. And this is essentially what are the main points this conference was going to decide. And at all previous conferences, this had been publicly available. You could go and ask it from the document centre or the press office. They had plenty of copies. You could just ask for one. I asked for it, and they pretended no such thing existed or had ever existed. They're driving it all underground. All these documents, all these negotiations that were once open and public, they're now secret. All the documents to do with those negotiations once public Just are like... now secret. And do you know why? Because at the Durban conference, the one I had to parachute in from 10,000 feet, I'd never skydived in my life before, I thought, well, uh, all I can do is hit the ground, and uh, the, the real danger is missing, but, you know, because I've got Irish ancestry, but I was all right, I hit the ground all right. And the point was there at that Durban conference, when I got the copy of the draft conclusions from the chair, it was just bonkers. They were advocating reducing the carbon dioxide concentration of the atmosphere from 400 parts per million to 200. Now, at 200 parts per million, most plants and trees on Earth would either die or struggle to survive. Crop yields would fall by up to 50%. And they were advocating this as a necessary measure. Wouldn't that kill a billion people, it's estimated, in a decade? It would, kill, it would have killed probably 5 billion of the 6 billion people then on Earth. It's 7 billion now. It would have killed something like 5 or 6 billion. It, it, was, it was an extraordinary policy. They wanted to set up an international climate court, which was going to try Western countries and... So it was the old plan that would kill a billion. They had one even worse. And all of this was in this treaty draft. 2,000 journalists were there. Not one newspaper or um, news medium around the world reported what was in... Well, how are we going to get the, in the intel out of uh, Paris then? We're going to have to have moles. I can't get in, of course. They banned me for life. But I have got people who are going to get in there, whether they like it or not, and they'll be feeding stuff out to me. The trouble is that even inside the conference, they will be doing their best to keep these documents secret until they've got them signed and agreed to by the... Well, criminals always try to operate in secret. In closing, uh, uh, tell us about the Las Vegas uh, summit coming up. And this is very important. In next week, from the 7th to the 9th of July, at the Mandalay Bay Hotel, Resort and Casino, the biggest um, resort in the whole of Las Vegas, right in the center of town, there's going to be the, the 9th Heartland International Climate Conference. Now, if you haven't registered to go to this conference yet, you've just about got time. You really will need to be quick because there's going to be about a thousand people there. It's a huge event. It's the biggest skeptical climate conference anywhere in the world. And we are going to be telling the world that there is nothing like as much to worry about as those profiteers of doom have been trying. All to right. Tell. Great job, Lord Moncton. We appreciate all of your time. I'm inviting you to Austin when you're here in the U.S. Calls are coming up.